The human hand is a versatile tool. It is unique across the species, and it is a, a tool that can express tons of different uh, abilities. It can range from the most tender emotions to violence. And this tool is developed from the beginning of uh, the childhood. It's uh, the little child, you know, explores and discovers the surrounding with the organs with the highest concentration of lips, uh, concentration of receptors, that is the lips and the uh, fingertips. With that information, different textures, different form, different shapes, it's incorporated into the integrity of a whole hand uh, capacity, which means that it's a sensimotor feedback and eventually it's a, a hand, an arm, that can control both the position, the balance, and the posture. Unfortunately, this is not a, a functions and integrity that can be guaranteed for life. And we all know that numerous diseases and accidents can happen to any one of us. And I would like to demonstrate maybe one of the most dramatic changes in terms of hand control and that is the high-level spinal cord injury that affects not only the hand and arm control, but also walking ability and a number of other um, functions. It can happen at any time. It can happen when you drive home from this event, God forbid. It can happen when you're skiing or snowboarding in the Alps around the corner. It can happen when you dive a sunny Sunday morning into shallow water. It can happen at home. It can happen when you're replacing a light bulb standing on a chair or a table and slipped. It can happen this time of the year when you harvest apples in your garden, climbing a ladder and falling down. This is a disaster to the individual. It is a disaster for the family. But it's not end of life. We have to remember that. It's not uh, that the whole mobility and the joy and the freedom is gone because of that. And I will show you a number of examples that we can improve ability, we can uh, improve uh, freedom, and we can improve joy with uh, surgical methods. So the priorities for a a spinal cord injured patient with all four extremity uh, paralyzed, that is tetraplegia. The priorities in a survey study demonstrated very clearly that the highest priority of function to get back would be arm and hand control. As a matter of fact, it's four to five times larger than any other function, as you can see in this bar graph. So I've indicated that nearly 50% of the individuals in these studies ranked the arm and hand function as the highest priority. So what can we do with hands? Well, if we somehow could get the hand and arm function back, we would be able to propel a wheelchair, or we could uh, also maneuver the joystick of an electrical wheelchair. Those two abilities together would give us not only hand and arm function, but also mobility. So the, the arms and hands would be not only arms and, and hands, but also the legs of the individual. So if that would be able to restore, it would be possible to work out something that could really improve mobility. So I would give you a little, tiny little surgical lesson here. It's not super long, it's not super complicated, because it's so wise. Nature has designed the spinal cord in a way that it, it has a hierarchical organization. That means that the loss of mobility after a high-level spinal cord injury is sort of a, a sticking to a pattern, which means that even if you have a spinal cord completely con transected, there are a number of nerves that are exiting 
the spinal cord above this level. And conducting electricity signals to the shoulder, maybe to the elbow, and sometimes all the down to the wrist level, but not the hand. This is the clue. And a very typical pattern is that you have three remaining elbow flexors and two remaining wrist flexors. So you can do this and you can do this. That's it. So that pattern can be used. You have three elbow flexors, you have two wrist accessors. What can you do with that? Well, you can typically use a, an elbow flexor, move it to a thumb flexor, and recreate thumb flexion. You can also move a wrist extensor because of the redundant function. You can move it to finger flexors. And suddenly you have the remaining fa functions, the elbow flexion, the wrist extension, but in addition to that, you have the thumb flexion and you have the finger flexion. And then you let gravity do its work and open the hand by setting the tension of the fingers. So this is a, a typical example, and I can just briefly illustrate it with these three pictures. The one to the left is an, an elbow flexor that is detached as its, its tendon insertion, and it's moved to the thumb flexor, and it's uh, re reanimating the thumb flexion. So that's the good news. And if we look at this, what has happened with this one out of three uh, elbow flexor, it's really a career this elbow flexor has done, now becoming the, the sole flexor of the thumb. That's the king of the hand. So that is a, quite a good career. In order to move on and to get this done in patients, we have a quite a, a dramatic discussion with the patients. Because before embarking on the journey of surgical intervention and uh, relearning, it is necessary that the ma we match the expectations and the goal from the patient and what we can do. We cannot have a mismatch of expectation at this, le this level, and this is going to be the outcome. That means that we have to calibrate each other and meet where it's a realistic expectation and surgery that can be performed. So once that is done, we have an informed patient who is much more motivated to undergo the extensive retraining of the new functions. The plasticity of the brain is unbelievable. They can just think about doing uh, the new function and its, its uh, services provided with the, an old motor, an old uh, muscle or a nerve impulse. So who can have this surgery? Well, anybody can have it. It has nothing to do with the kind of, of int intelligence you have, social background, previous experience of training, gender, age, even time elapsed from the incident, the accident that caused this uh, dramatic effect, and reconstruction is a factor. In, a, in other words, it's like quit smoking or falling in love. It's never too late. So at this point, I would like you to meet some people, some people with completely different goals. And this is very important. This is one of the main things preoperatively, is that we really uh, define the goals of the patient. And Different goals can be like in this lady who fell from a high level. She wanted two things primarily. She wanted to be able to write um, one-handed instead of using the supporting two-handed. She also wanted to get individual freedom and be able to operate her smartphone on her own and not having her assistant reading every single message and texting back. That is an integrity thing. So 
that goal we could uh, define together and we could, as you see here in this picture, achieve the goal quite uh, clearly already four weeks after surgery. This training starts immediately after surgery and uh, is pursued as long as it's uh, uh, necessary, which is rest of life. This man also fell from a construction scaffold, broke his neck, was completely left without hand function. And after reconstruction, he is back in business and he's enjoying working with his multifunction tool, his forestry machine, and that is also some sort of mobility. This uh, artist, she sustained a traffic accident. She was paralyzed. And you can imagine how devastating it was for an, for an artist, a painter, who could not paint single-handed anymore and had to do this kind of disorganized drawing. She regained her hand function after surgical intervention and retraining, and this is her expression of the kind of freedom she experienced after having hand function reanimated. This patient, look carefully at him. He has a very, very high uh, injury. Look at the frustration when he is trying to feed himself, pretend to feed himself. You can just let it sink in. This is really no control. He has a device to just tuck, tuck in the, uh, the fork, but other than that, it's not possible. After extensive surgery, this control, this included both nerves transfer and tendon, muscle tendon transfer, and he was able to. Uh, it is a, it not as spectacular in, in, in the way of, of uh, uh, presenting the patient, but at the daily basis, it's a dramatic effect. So, I have listed here a number of patients and presented these examples and presented this existing surgery, not because it's magical, because it's not really magical. It's simple surgery, and it's based on a collection of basic science data over years and also a refining of the relearning uh, rehabilitation. I also have shown you these examples because I want you to look upon the spinal cord patients, the handicapped, as people with intact brain and the right to make their own informed decisions, what kind of treatment they can have when they want to have it and also have access to it. It's good for the individual, but it's also good for the society, the community, because increased free freedom reduces the need for personal assistance. And that is a reduced cost that may endure for 40 or 50 or 60 years. I have also shown you this because I want to increase the awareness of this type of, of service. I want people to know more about it. I want, um, in many countries where there's no or very limited interest in this field, to get more information. I also want to um, thank, at this point, Ted for making this possible and for increasing the awareness. Thank you all for your attention and drive safely. <laughs>